Hello, welcome to Values, Virtues, Ethics and Morality. My name is Magla Pele and today I'm in the studio with Sister Denise who has been practicing Raj Yoga meditation with the Brahma Kumaris for over 40 years. Today we'll be looking at the subject of excessive force. Um, the format that this conversation will take is called Socratic Dialogue, which is a method of putting questions to another in order to elicit a clear expression of the truth. The purpose of this program is to look at the conventional values, look at and question the conventional values held by mankind to question, to dialogue and analyze whether the values and morals and ethics that we hold um, today is of any use to us and whether it's causing us uh, good or harm and to that end Sister Denise is here to uh, give us some answers on the subject. We did note that um, most people would like to do the right thing or choose more often than not to do the right thing and yet they still act against their conscience and still do things that are not right. So Sister Denise, very warm welcome to today's show. Thank you. And uh, thank you for joining us. Sister Denise, could you please uh, tell us um, what is meant by the term excessive force? And um, whilst I ask you the question, uh, the word justifiable force comes to mind. When someone is doing something wrong, antisocial, against the law or whatever, they know and they know that there are going to be consequences which are foreseeable. When the consequences are beyond the, um, what you are calling as justifiable force, when they're beyond justifiable, when they can't be justified, that's when they cross that line and become excessive. So if a person is doing something wrong, they're prepared to face the consequences which are um, in correspondence with the nature of the thing that's wrong. So you'd know that I'm doing this, I'm going to pay this much, but if all of a sudden you have to pay ten times, you resent it. Mm. And so this is where the excessive word comes in. Mm. So if it is unjustifiable, if it is beyond reasonable, then something else kicks in and then it says that my resistance to that excessive force is justifiable. My wrong action is suddenly a right action because of the excessive force. And so it's very important if a government or a, um, a law enforcement agency response to antisocial or wrong action. It's very important that that is commensurate with the crime because if it isn't, it justifies that person to continue with that crime. Mm. We see situations where people in authority, um, either political, either police, either um, at school level are being questioned with the force that they use uh, in order to protect. Um, what would your take be on this? Why is there now suddenly more focus on this than there was in the past? Because the person who is doing the action which is against the um, the the power, the, the people who are in power or the institution that's in power are seen to have rights that previously they were not seen to have. So that there is a better kind of 
equity between the people who are who can be punished and the punishers you see if all the power goes to the people in authority and there is no no rights accorded to the people who challenge that authority then that authority can get away with excessive force very easily but as soon as you start to say no the people who are resisting or challenging that authority figure or institution um, they have rights and they are justified in questioning that authority uh, it changes the game mm. you see and I think this is why um, people are looking at it differently now because it is it has been seen that there have been a lot of instances of excessive force and so the sound of the voice of those who are um, challenging that excessive use of force is now getting more power and so the opinion you can say the world opinion is now going with those who are the victims of excessive force and against the people who are um, saying we have to use this much force and they're saying no you don't uh, excuse me where is your calculation you see so that whole question of um, commensurate uh, force is has to be calculated in a proper way mm. um, I understand what you're saying but um, it is a basic human instinct to protect and especially um, when it comes to your life or in the lives of the uh, people whom you love and in the case of a prime minister of the country his people okay so um, in such a scenario it's how on earth does one measure when force is excessive if there's an actual threat uh, to your life or if there's a loss of life well the examples that come to mind uh, that have been happening in the last little while are um, people who were sitting in nonviolent protest and the numbers of those people becoming large um, what you have in situations like that is you get agent provocateur who gets sent in by uh, usually by the people who are in power to create a reason to give excessive forceful response to this peaceful protest and then they will start to um, act against the people who are in peaceful protest with tear gas, with bullets, uh, causing deaths, uh, charging into a crowd of common citizens who have a right to protest uh, peacefully, you see. And this is where um, we'd say that it is an overreaction because there is no threat. Mm. And you're reacting as if there is a threat, except that there isn't, you see. Now, if there is a threat, if somebody's throwing stones and you reply with guns, that's excessive. If somebody is throwing Molotov cocktails and you reply with guns, it's getting a little bit more equal. If pe people are using guns and that's being responded with guns, where you have start you start to have what we call as guerrilla warfare then uh, then everybody's on the level of firearms and so that then becomes an out of control situation where then it is justifiable to use uh, strong weapons but you have to see the commensurability of the thing mm -hmm. and you see when people are doing something that is their legal right and then all of a sudden you change the laws and make it not their legal right that is also not okay because it means that your position of power is not um, justified. You're um, putting yourself in a position of power at the expense of the people. 
And so people uh, can, uh, give uh, validity to a government. There's a social contract here. And if the government says, you know, uh, whatever we want, there, there is no limit to what we can do because we create the law, then all of a sudden their rights have gone because the social contract has been violated. Do you see? Mm, yes, that makes sense. Tell me, how does the law of karma um, kick into operation here? You mentioned that law under a different topic. Mm. Well, normally when we're talking about the law of karma, we're talking about individuals versus individuals, as it were. But it does also apply in terms of the collective, but it's a lot more difficult to define and describe because there are so many mitigating factors or additional factors that are very difficult to calculate. But if you have one religion in a war with another religion, then you can get a karma account between those peoples of those religions. And because of religion being the factor that differentiates them, it becomes a little bit possible to see where the karmic account is happening. Mm -hmm. But where you get a group of people in opposition to another group of people, and then these groups keep changing their identities, you can say, then it becomes very difficult to calculate. Okay. Um, from what you just said, uh, this is what I understand. If somebody uses um, violence or forced, uh, force against one country, then that country, in order to protect itself, is justifiable in using the same amount of force back. Yes. Okay. But when it exceeds that, then um, it becomes what, revenge? Well, you can call it revenge, or you can say that um, there's an unfairness about it because, uh, because it's moving out of equitability. You see, for example, the Second World War ended when two nuclear bombs were used to destroy a very large number of people in two Japanese cities. And this created such a response of horror in the international community that it was so like extreme that the war stopped. Um, and so people will, will say that, well, okay, now that you have released a nuclear bomb, uh, okay, you have said, you have asserted that you are powerful, but what you've also done is you have given justification to other people to say, okay, well now we can do that and we can go a little bit further. And so the problem of war is that it creates a situation of endless escalation. And when you have a situation like that, then the escalation finishes in, you know, total war um, with everybody finished. So that is the direction that people are going in and people are saying, well, of course, nobody will do that. But then sometimes people do that, that they say nobody will do. And then they can't say nobody would do that anymore because they do. Mm. So then the assumptions about what people will and won't do have to change to correspond with what they actually do, where you go beyond what is considered possible, and then from impossible it becomes possible. Mm. Um, if one is involved in an argument with another, and the one person is emotionally violent, by that I mean hurls abuse, call, name calling, etc., and the other one out of sheer anger responds by physical violence. Is that excessive force? I'm thinking of uh, the domestic violence scenarios that uh, have become all too common in today's world. I think again you've got a question of escalation. You mm. know, the thing starts with somebody saying something to somebody mm. and then there's a long history. So 
it's almost as if you carry on where you left off the last time. Mm. So again, you have the problem of escalation. So it'll go from verbal to um, different forms of emotional, then it'll get physical, then it'll get very physical, then, then, then. So, so Denise, what you're saying is that in certain scenarios, force is justifiable? The use of actual physical force is justifiable? Um, because um, if one looks at spirituality and the premise that it shares with medicine, do no harm, um, I would think that it implies no force should be used. Because the moment you use any force, you're creating karma. And the scenario that comes to mind is if um, a um, militia from one country attack um, another country, then uh, in retaliation, country B will attack the militia as well as civilians. Any time that you use force, um, even if you have to use force because you're defending yourself, you're also opening up the gates for the other side to use more force back. And then you come into the question of escalation. So from a theoretical point of view, any use of force is going to create more use of force until some final moment where everything is destroyed. But um, anything that you can do to avoid using force is going to be better. Okay. Um, what is the alternative to use uh, to using any force at all? Um, is it naive to believe that one could use conversation, um, mediation, arbitration? Is no, it, is me it mediation, naive? arbitration, conversation? is the best uh, but of course historically we have seen many instances where uh, and I'm thinking of um, uh, an incident in the question of the Palestinian and Israeli conflict where um, a, a person from Sweden had gone in there as a United Nations mediator, but then he got assassinated. So, you know, there are so many forces acting to um, compromise, to sabotage any effort to bring us away from armed conflict that then what can you do? You have to try and um, the way things are going is they're headed into a more and more violent direction. So then in that case, you say, okay, what can the individual do? Build up one's personal peace, build up one's resilience, because all of these scenes of violence take place perceived by individuals. And the individuals who perceive these are also very negatively affected. So if you are unable to do anything about the situation, you can't save the world, save yourself. You okay. know, make yourself able to get through it. Okay, we, that's the subject I'd like to take up now. How does one do that? If you are uh, subjected to part of witness to uh, force all around you, if a loved one gets um, murdered as a result of um, senseless violence, well, where a bullet was intended for A and a hit B, mm -hmm. happened to be a loved one, how does one deal with that? It's very trauma? difficult to deal with that. And the only way that you can deal with it, I think, is to, from now, uh, do as much as you possibly can to reinforce yourself spiritually because anything you do in that regard is going to diminish the impact of such events if they do occur. And to me, there are so many such events happening all around in all directions to so many people that it seems a very important priority to set about making oneself spiritually strong, emotionally stable, and so on. Because the 
the times that we're passing through are extremely stressful and we have to give attention to that. We can't say, oh, it's always ever been like that, so it doesn't matter, you know, I can just not bother about it. I think, no. I think the times we're going through are very difficult and that we must give attention to how do I brace myself and prepare myself to be able to go through any eventuality. Um, this is a kind of way of being sensible. Okay. Uh, Sister Denise, the past decade or two, we've seen some um, escalating uh, acts of nature that can also fall into the category of excessive force. Okay? Uh, I once heard it said it's as if Mother Nature is angry. Okay? Uh, is Mother Nature sending us a message with tsunamis, with countries that have no history of hurricanes, experiencing hurricanes, which with countries that have no history of earthquakes, uh, without fault lines, suffering earthquakes? Is there a message? Well, I think that the Earth is actually going through a very, very deep change and human society is also going through a very deep change. So we are in a period of time where things are much more unstable than at other times. Change is always going on, but sometimes there's cataclysmic change and sometimes there's very, very slow change. And if we're in a period of time of cataclysmic change, on the one hand, you could say, well, it is the karmic response of nature to the human abuse of the bounty of nature, which is a very valid position to take. And then on the other hand, you know, there are people who will say, well, we didn't do anything bad to the sun, and the sun is you know, very much, you know, out of, out of its stability. But the sun is also the element of fire. And the nature is made of air, earth, water, fire and ether. And even human thought being negative, actions being negative, affect negatively all the elements of nature because they're all connected with each other even if the sun is millions of miles away is still part of the material universe which exists to um, sustain and nurture humanity primarily and then all the other creatures so we are looking at um, a kind of moment of reckoning and uh, then we have to say to ourselves okay there's nothing I can do about this but as an eternal and immortal soul I will always exist so therefore I cannot avoid the necessity of moving myself through very unstable times which means I have to be very stable mm. you see so leaving aside karma blame and so on there is um, big change happening, so I need to be able to get through. And where does God fit into this picture? Because my understanding of God is that um, he's the antithesis of violence. So where does he fit into the picture of force, force from um, humanity, force from nature, force from wars, etc.? Well, there are many things about God that are known and many things that are unknown. And one of the things about God that is said in some cultures is that God doesn't do anything, doesn't think anything, knows everything. And Say that again, please. Doesn't do anything, mm -hmm. doesn't think anything, but knows everything. Okay. And uh, God sometimes will take the position of a detached observer and just see how everything is happening. Not being responsible for natural calamities. Very often people say, you know, I'm not going to insure you against an act of God. These are not acts of God. These are acts of nature mm. which occur in troubled times, wars are acts of humans which occur in very troubled times. 
But when you have a very, very cataclysmic circumstances, uh, God will be observing all of this, knowing in advance that every so often the human world has to pass through such things. Mm. And I think that God is the protector of the world so that when people are connected with God during times of upheaval, that gives you the ability to get through um, with the least amount of uh, disturbance. Um, when one looks at the um, excessive force and God, um, one can't help but notice that in the world there are many who uh, justify the use of force and extreme violence in the name of God. Why is that? What's up with that? And what is the consequence of that? Well, there are many people who will take the name of God to uh, validate the position that they are taking. And they will say, well, I'm taking this position, I'm representing God. You know, and God would say, excuse me, you're not representing me at all, you're representing yourself and you're using my name inappropriately, you see. And that becomes a negative karma between a person or group of people and God, because there is karmic account between people and God. Mm. Mm. And so what you want is, um, you want to have the presence of God with you, the protection of God with you, the company of God with you, and so you want to be in very good relationship with God in order to have that. Otherwise, God will say, well, you're on your own, mm. you know. Um, there is a saying in India that at the time of destruction, those who have hatred for God in their intellect, they are destroyed. And at the time of destruction, those with love in their intellect for God, they are victorious. Now this is a very, very ancient phrase that is known, but nobody really knows quite how to interpret it or what it really means. Now when we are in times where there's a great deal of upheaval and then we see such a phrase and we say, you know, is this something that applies to now? And then we say, well, do I have love in my intellect for God? And what does that mean? How do I um, calculate that? How do I ensure that I'm not having hatred for God? Because if I have God with me, I'm better off. Mm. So then you need to really start thinking about what is hatred for God? What is love for God? What does that mean? Okay. Okay, on that divine note, Sister Denise, we thank you for joining us today. Uh, the subject was extremely interesting. Um, excessive force is not something that one normally thinks about, although it's uh, very prevalent in the world that we live in today. And Sister Denise described that there are situations where force is necessary, but this, as soon as you cross the line that your conscience tells you you shouldn't be crossing, then you're actually creating an account. And Sister Denise also advised that the best way to protect yourself, whether you are in the scenario or simply watching it on television, is to create for yourself your own peace through divine assistance so that um, it ceases to become your reality and peace becomes your reality. Uh, Sister Denise, we appreciate your time and the wisdom uh, that you shared with us today. I took a lot from it and I hope that you at home have done so as well. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you and goodbye.